Well, uh, it's still morning, right? Yeah. Amen. I love you guys. I feel, I feel like we're family. All right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Once you hold hands with somebody and say to Jesus and me. <laughs> Amen, amen. Y'all, 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 make sure that fellowship happened. Um, thank you for buying the book. I appreciate it. Get my family out the hood. Y'all gonna get, make sure my little 72 book sale? So I can tell my, tell my wife. I think they'll be great for your leadership teams. It's a great leadership book. It's great for small groups. It's a great gift to a leader to get it. And um, I poured my life into it. I, I wrote the book myself. I did not, it wasn't ghost written. It's my work. I just want my glasses so I can see everybody. And then, um, are these yours or these mine? Yeah, so that, um, yeah. So thank you for your support. Thank you for mentioning the book, Pastor. And I will sign it for you. Let's, let's talk about, um, so during the break, I got a couple of questions um, and we, you know, the problem with, 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 with this is, is just our time constraint, mm -hmm. but I think we can maximize the time. Um, so what I, what, I, what, I was, what I was asked to do by your pastor was talk about church growth mm -hmm. and how we did it, how our church did what we did, and how we, reached, how we focused on unchurched people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about that. When I started Zion Church, I had been in youth ministry for several years. Um, back um, in the mid '80s, I started preaching, and uh, and around 1990, I was doing a lot of preaching around in different churches in the Washington D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. And I got I was getting tired. I just wanted to be at one church. So in 1990, I started getting this desire to pastor. And um, and what what happens in the typical traditional Black Baptist church? when a church is what they call vacant, that means the pastor retired, resigned, or died. That means that church is what they call vacant. That means there's a pastorate that's open. And if you get invited, you can become a candidate to be the pastor of that church. That's what the language is. So in 1990, I got my first candidacy to be the pastor of a church, and I was so excited. Newly married, my wife and I have been married a year. We had, a, we had um, been married a year. We had an infant, newborn. And that church turned me down. They never told me why. They didn't even call me. I think I called them and they said, we picked somebody else. And for over the next 10 years, I went through that process five times. Now, that might not sound, sound like a lot, but when you go through the process, it takes months to go through. Yeah, yeah. It's a month. It's, they interview you. They follow you around. Yeah. You come and you preach. Then you meet with the leaders. You teach a Sunday school class. They get your vision. They, they simulate stuff. I mean, it's months, and then you get told no. Five different churches told me no. Nobody thought I was good enough to be their pastor. I had never heard of church planting. Somebody, we had two Bible college students living with us, my wife and I, and one of them had a textbook called The Purpose Driven Church yeah. by Rick Warren. Yeah. So I went to my shelf. She had it on our shelf. She said, oh, it's a textbook. I don't even need it anymore. I said, well, can I have it? I read that book six times. I had it marked up and everything. And so that's when I got a desire to start a church. Yeah. Our church was so much like Rick Warren passes a church called Saddleback Church yeah. in yeah. Orange County, California. Yeah. My church was so much like Saddle, Saddleback, I started to call my church Saddle Black. <laughs> that's just, I stole everything he did, everything he did. We were Saddle Black. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so, but what I, what I focused on was unchurched, unsaved, uncommitted uns. We were going out to uns. Yeah. Now, I had to start it with people who were saved because those were the people I was connected with. Yeah. We started with a Bible study of 25 Christians. And, but I always told them, we're going out to unsaved people. We've got to have a short service. We can't be, because I started interviewing people. And when I would tell, ask people, why are you going to go to church? They would say, because I don't have church clothes. Yeah. That was a big thing. Yeah. And I knew what church clothes meant. That mean they didn't have the dress with the stockings and the hat. They ain't had the suits and three yeah, buttons yeah. and all that. Yeah. And if they ain't got that, they're gonna come on Easter and they see you again Mother's Day, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So we had to first of all change our church attire and say, wear whatever you got. Yeah. But I was still wearing suits when I started it. Mm. So I noticed the men didn't feel comfortable dressing down because I wasn't dressed down. Well now I dress like this, so everybody can wear what you got. We just, we just would appreciate you covering up everything, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that's, just, that's our preference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just cover it, amen, yeah. glory to God. Yeah. So, 
So that made a difference. Now you can invite people to a church and you can wear whatever you got. And we guaranteed it was going to be 60 minutes. That, was, that set us apart. That was our unique marketing advantage. Every church has got to have a unique marketing advantage. It's a UMA. You've got to have a unique marketing position that separates you from everybody. Why would they come to your church? What sets you apart? What set us apart is even if the preaching was terrible and everything was terrible, it was quick. We were like, we were like mass. Catholic, you ever go into Catholic church, you be in that joint, you be, by the time you sit down, you out of there, you be like, oh, my Father, in the Holy Spirit, in the land, grace be unto you also, God bless you. We were out of there. We were 60 minutes. If we went over 60 minutes, we'd apologize. We could even have a guarantee, we could guarantee it. We're going to be out there, we had it down. We'd be like 58 minutes, 59 minutes. And people, now all the churchy people like, you can't squinch the, you can't squinch the Holy Ghost. And let the Holy Ghost have his way. Well, we had, we started off from day one with two services. We had so many people show up, we couldn't put them all in the banquet hall that we were in, the, 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 the hotel room um, that we had it in. We couldn't fit everybody in there. We had to do two services the first day that we had service. Because people were looking for something different. So we knew that the churchy people, so we, they want to be in there, they want to lay out on the floor and slob on the carpet and wait, lay before the Lord and, and get a rhema word. They wanted to get all that, get prophesied over, hands laid, demons cast out, all that. So this ain't that church. You got to go to, see, and I like worship like that. I'm a worshiper. I like worship that's sustained. I'd rather worship than preach. I love some good worship. I'm talking about worship that get deep, you know. But, but the, the church ain't for me. See, the problem leaders make is, is you think you're the customer. So you're trying to reach sinners with saint bait. Jesus says, let's go fishing for men, and you're using saint bait to reach sinners. So you want to do an outreach to the community and bring Shirley Caesar in. Skeet and Sputnik and Christian Baby Father ain't coming to that. Now get Lil Wayne to come. I've had Tank at my church on Sunday morning singing his love songs. I've had Lettucey on Sunday morning. We're trying to get Anthony Hamilton now. We are bringing the secular artists because you know what? We had Tank coming in. I told him. I said, Tank will come in and take his shirt off. Y'all know who Tank is because y'all too saved. But Tank is an R&B artist that's real cut up. He sings love songs, take his shirt off, and the women throw their underwear on the stage. He's just, he like that. I said, we're going to have Tank here. It's controversial, but Tank sang, then I preached to an audience that I wouldn't have preached to if Tank wasn't there. Because I'll do anything to reach some heathen, because I know my heart. And I knew him. I knew he had a relationship with God, but he's struggling. So I also interviewed him, and we talked about that. I tried to get him to sing a hymn. He couldn't even sing it. He couldn't even remember the, the church songs that he used to sing. It was, he's so deep steeped in it. But you know what we did? We loved on him and his family. And so he tweets about our church. Him and his girlfriend, who's a model, they talk about two churches that we go to. So that's, that's exposure to the, to the world we're trying to reach. Wow. Now, we have Fred Hammond come to our church. We've had Israel come to our church. But that don't draw any heathen. All that do, we get Ty Tribbett to come in there, all the church people coming from other churches. Yeah, yeah. I ain't trying to reach church people. It's yeah. enough heathen. Yeah. You got to be intentional about your target. Yeah. How many of you ever been fishing before? Yeah. 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 Now, I'm not a fisherman. I don't, I don't fish, but I know fishing is tricky. Fishing is deceit. Yeah. 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 You got to catch fish. Yeah. Yeah. They don't come to you like, can I get in your boat? Can you take me home and cook me? <laughs> can you fry me up in a pan and chew me up? No, fish don't do that. They have a network. They had a fish network. We got the dictionary. They got a fish network down there saying, look out for the hooks. There's a lot of hooks in the water today. Be careful. So fishermen put something on the hook that makes it look like they care about the fish. You ain't trying to feed the fish, you're trying to feed yourself. Yeah. And catch them fish and trap them like that. And there's different, yeah, I heard from fishermen, there's different fish you catch in different parts of water. Yeah. Yeah. And there's different bait for different fish. Yeah. So when you out on the boat with you and your fellas or your ladies and y'all fishing, you got, you got on the boat, you got chicken sandwiches, you got buffalo wings, turkey sandwich. You don't put that in the water. <laughs> That's what you eat. Christians, we keep trying to get a world what we like and wonder why they don't come. I study the world. I know what they like. 
I'll come up on a secular song. I know y'all think we're going to hell, but we're reaching people. I'm, I'm specializing in reaching heathen. We specialize. See, that's that. So we don't ever have, we really, my, my brother is very security conscious. That's one of his, he pays attention to danger. The reason why I don't worry as much is because we got all the thieves at our church. If you reach the thieves, you don't have to worry about them. They're, they're thieving brothers coming in. Not here. This is my people's right here. Don't, we can't rob them. We good. That's why we want all the thugs, all the criminals to be in your, in your congregation. So you might be sitting next to somebody in my church and they smell like weed. Or they smell like liquor. Or they smell like smoke. They smell like, watch this, watch this. See, see, you used to too. Yeah, 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 yeah. They smell like where they've been. Yeah. And you used to do it too. Yeah. But you done been in Christ so long that the smell bothers you. Fishing is stinky business. You can't have a pristine ministry if you're going to have a, a fishing service. Yeah. See, we want to be all pristine and want everybody to follow protocol. They don't even know the protocol. My brother gets ticked off every week. He said, they did it again, man. They did it again. I just laughed because he's so church now. He forgot he's the biggest heathen in the world. He's so church now. But he get mad because when, as soon as I finish preaching, they leave. They don't know show over. It'd be like a mass exodus. But, it's a, but, but what it, they don't know what the benediction is. You know, the final blessing. Don't miss your final blessing. They don't know none of that stuff. We got to teach them that. Obviously, we try to teach them. But when the sermon is over, it's just like the concert. It's just like when the buzzer goes over the game. They're trying to beat the traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow. But, but if we're moving money at that time, it creates danger in the hallways. So I understand that. Yeah. But again, you can't, you can't be reaching heathen and expect it to be pristine. Yeah. It's work. It's work, but it works. Yeah. And so we started in 2000. We had 3,700 people Sunday at our three locations. Most of them at our main location. We had three locations. Yeah. We, had, we had about 8,000 people watching online. Wow. So we can, you, can count, you can count devices that are watching. We don't know how many people are watching each device, but we know we had about 8,000 devices tuned in to our services online. That's a very important means of reaching people yeah. because it's an infinitely expandable platform. You don't need cars, you don't need parking, you don't need chairs. Yeah. It's, you just need internet and cameras. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and, and it brings in more revenue than it costs us to put it out, which is very wise. Yeah. So let me, let me tell you, there, there are basically three reasons why people come to church. And 2,000 years since Pentecost has not changed that. Mm -hmm. People come to church for three reasons. They come for preaching, they come for music, and they come for relationships. The social aspect. In fact, some people who have close relationships, when you got people in your church who have strong relationships in the church, they're solid. The preaching can be bad. They come for their friends. They're in community. They're in small groups. So you got to make sure you got to make sure as much as you can, those three components are strong. Some people will come to church and the preaching is good and the relationship is strong and the music is terrible. Oh, Lord. Somebody said, well. <laughs> Everybody want to know, who's that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, can, you, you, can, you can make those three entities as strong as possible. Let me tell you another thing. Your facilities matter in growing a church. Sometimes we're so close to our facilities that we don't see things that are wrong. So we don't see what needs to be painted. And this wall got a hole in it. And we've just been acting like we just set a chair in front of it five years ago. Nobody, everybody wondering why you can't move that chair. You don't move that chair. That's a chair that blocked the hole. Yeah. All we needed was Brother Ray to come in and do the drywall work. Right, right, right. And we can move the chair and use it to sit somebody in it. That's what the chair's purpose is. Yeah. I think that's funny myself. But, um, so, facilities, Samuel Chan said there are five important rooms in every church. The first is, and it's not in any particular order, but your foyer is important. You all have a beautiful foyer here. It lends itself to fellowship, to dialogue, to, to refreshments, all that. That's great. A second important room is the ladies' room. The ladies' room had better be clean and nice because ladies don't just go to use the bathroom. 
they go in groups. <laughs> they fellowship. Now, if any man said, hey, let's go to the bathroom, we have a serious situation. <laughs> you have to stretch your hands in that direction. But every lady at that table can say, let's go to the bathroom. Won't nobody think twice. Yeah. <laughs> Men don't be saying, let's go to the bathroom. We, we, if you, in fact, if I'm at a table and you say, I'm going to the bathroom, I'll just hold mine until you get back. I'm like, I was going to go too, but I ain't going with you. <laughs> One lady said, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm going with you, girl. Come on, come on. We don't even care how nice the bathroom is. This guy have a toilet in it. Ladies' room, nice. Nursery, very important. Clean, sanitary. Check in and out system needs to be secure. Because there are times in a, and let me tell you, when, when, there are two times when parents, when unchurched parents really make a decision to come to church. Let me give you this. When unchurched parents decide to come to church when they have a baby, when they have a young children, they be like, we need to get our family in church. So when they come, they're not first looking at the sermon, and they're, not, they're looking at the accommodations for the children. Another time, unchurched parents want to come to church, they start getting interested in spiritual things when they have teenagers. They be like, we need some help with this. So you got to invest in youth ministry. A church without a comprehensive quality youth pastor is in trouble. I'm telling you right now, you're in trouble. Because some churches will hire a youth pastor before they hire a secretary. They ain't got no music played. They got, they got some for them kids. Because people are not married to denomination anymore. They could have grew up AME. But if the Bible Fellowship Church got the great youth group, group program and they're reaching my kids, and my kids like it here, I will go there even though I'd rather have the liturgy like I did and all of the stuff and the accoutrements and glory of Patry and I believe in God the Father Almighty, make of heaven and earth and Jesus Christ is the Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose again with all power in his hand. I believe in the church universal, the Holy Spirit. I, that's, yeah, anyway. Some of y'all missed that. Where my AME people? Anybody have AME history? They missed that. But they got something here for my kids. That matters. So, so I'm back on nursery. I'm talking about facilities, right? You, directional signs are so important in the church, and people don't take that seriously. When y'all walk in here, y'all know where everything is because you've been here. But people don't know. Like, I was walking to the women's room earlier today because somebody just said the bathroom's that way. Well, it didn't. It's not clear when you got, I got astigmatism. You know, you know what would have happened if I walked in that lady's room? There would have been a situation. <laughs> been a situation. So, so, so I'm, not, I'm just saying directional signs. This is this way. This is this way. When, I, when I'm in an airport, people in uniform. People at church don't want to wear uniforms because they want to wear their outfits. It was so hard for us to get people to wear T-shirts and to, to, to identify them. Here's somebody who can help you. You got thousands of people walking in here. They need to, they, they're lost. How is it, how can I tell when I come to your church who I can go to for help? What identifies them? Well, he got on, he got on a three-piece suit. He got on jeans and sweat. Who, who's who? When you're in the airport and you lost, don't you look for somebody with a Delta outfit on or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're looking for uniform, because I'm lost. And I can't wait for somebody to say, how can I help you? Because there's too much going on. And we're not aware of the guest experience. Sometimes you need a guest to do, to do a critical visit of your church, yeah. top to bottom. What is it about our church that we can improve? Coming into the church, directions, the website, yeah. Yeah. everything. Yeah. Many people make their first visit to the church. I'd say now 90% 90, 90 of people make their first visit to your church online to your website, and they will make a conclusion about your church based on how updated it is. If you still got on there that we're going away for the men's retreat this weekend, it's the third Sunday in May, people have already concluded this is a ghetto church. They don't operate in excellence. 
I'm just saying, people draw conclusions, and you may have an anointed, powerful, effective ministry, but people are making judgments about the quality of your ministry all the time. The parking lot is another room, it's a part of the church. Is the parking lot lined, is it clean? Are the people out there nice and firm? You can't just be firm, you gotta be nice too. Those are your pre-evangelists. People have already made a, a, a determination about the preacher based on the parking lot dude. Oh, there's some gangsters up here. Pastor must be a thug. He got this dude working in the parking lot. Did I say boo the car over there? We ain't got no more spots over here. No, back it in. Okay, go ahead and put it in forward like that. You gonna put it in forward like that. But they ain't gonna hear a word he say when he preaches. The whole thing is, can you believe how that man talked to us? How he pointed at us and treated us like we little kids? And you know what gets me? The nastiest people in the church want to greet. You don't even look greet. You don't even look welcoming. <laughs> Your face looks rejecting. You just like. You just look like somebody passed gas. You <laughs> and you want to agree? But we let them because they volunteer. I'm telling you, you got to look at everything. How can we have nice greeters? Nice people. Be nice. You're a witness. You're a part of the reflection of the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything you do. Yes, sir. You, you shouting or you got a question? I'm a golden retriever. I love everybody. My buddy, Rich, that's all Rich. Yeah. Was, you know those people that just can't be around other people? They should be in a cubicle somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that was Rich. Yeah. The pastor made him the greeter. Oh, man. And his first five minutes, this young woman walks in. Wow. <laughs> Ten minutes later, a couple walks in, an older woman, a younger man. He goes, oh, is this your mom? And he goes, no, it's my fiance. Wow. <laughs> None of those people ever came to me. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to tell you that. Amen. Talking we talking about church growth. <laughs> That'll take a church right down the tubes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> There's a place in New York where my daughter used to live called the Barclay Center. It was recently built. It's been built within the last five years. And the people who run the Barclay Center hired Disney for what they call their street to seat experience. They brought Disney in. They said, they said we want to be a world-class facility, the Barclay Center, but we want the experience to happen from the time people hit our city. From anywhere near this facility, how can we make the experience first class? Because you know, if you ever go to a Disney venue, whether it's Disney World or Disneyland, they think about it from street to seat. They don't just have a parking lot, they got the Scooby-Doo parking lot. And then they'll have a train pick you up in the parking lot. And then if it gets too hot while you're standing in line, every now and then you'll find and there'll be a mist. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They have a fan blowing mist in your face, like a, from the Jordan River. That's somebody who's thought yeah, yeah. about the experience. Yeah. Have we thought about the experience? The, experience? Yeah. the sound, yeah. dead spots, lighting. Yeah. Have we thought about, are we, are we ruthlessly thinking about the experience? And do we think about it from a heathen perspective? Amen. Let me tell you something else we do about, we do about reaching on church people strategically. I don't say stuff that, see church people, we have lingo. Like I bind that, I plead the blood, pull out your sword. Well a dude from the, from the gang is like, uh oh, it's about to go down in here, they pulling out swords, they pleading the blood. They the bloods, he pleading the blood, he pleading the crips. We talk all that stuff like, like, like everybody knows it. Then we say we come against that Lucy and all that, they, they don't know that. You gotta talk in a language, so I don't say, y'all remember Job, don't you? You know what I say? There's a man in the Bible named Job. He lost everything he had. I didn't lose the unsaved person and I didn't, I didn't undermine the saved person. Right. 
But just with a tweak of language, yeah. I kept everybody thinking on the same level so that they didn't have to feel like an outsider. Some of us, we sing songs like, I didn't know the song, second song you sang, right? Yeah. So having lyrics, I, know, I, know, I saw your screens in there, so I know you had the words on the screen. But if we can't participate, because yeah. we don't know it, yeah. and if the words are spelled wrong or the person doing media shout or PowerPoint is not keeping up, how am I singing the song? You on the last verse, they sing the next. <laughs> Keep up with the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you three reasons why people leave church. Cause, cause, cause some of it, and I'm coming to you. Some of it is not just opening the doors so that we get a, so we get more fish. It's why are people not staying. Here are three reasons why people leave a church. They leave it because there's no longer a dream that they can support. They don't feel appreciated. And they don't feel like they're being mentored. This is how you can lose good people. I call it a dam. People will leave, good people will leave a church because they're no longer clear on the dream. Ambiguous vision frustrates people. And so when, when there's no clear dream, because everybody needs a dream to either drive them or drag them. Either my dream pushes me or it pulls me. I don't even have to have my own dream. If your dream is big enough, I'll support yours. But if it's blurry, I can't support it. So people will leave when there's not a clear dream or when they don't feel appreciated. They'll go to a church with, 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 the doctrine ain't even right. You say, Cynthia, why are you over here? Well, you know, I did the flower ministry over at Restoration. <laughs> I put them flowers up there. You ain't never seen them flowers. I'll be putting them up there. I put them up there every week in the fly. And you know, they never said thank you one time. I did them flowers for six years out of my own money. Me and Sam almost lost our house buying them flowers. <laughs> When I came over here to Jubilee Temple, the pastor shouted me out every Sunday, look at these flowers. There ain't but four people in there. Look at these flowers. And we might say, well, that sure is shallow. But what we have to do as leaders is, is systemically thank people. You know the Bible says give thanks? Right, there's a scripture that says give thanks always. Now watch this now, this is going to get you. Who do you think it's talking about? Give thanks to who? See, we always think it's only giving thanks to God. But if God says give thanks always, thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Derek. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all missed that. That was good. That's a shouting point right there. I, if I'm thankful, it's not just vertical. You got to give horizontal appreciation. Some of us in here say, you should be a soldier. You shouldn't be doing this for the thanks. You shouldn't be doing it for the credit. Well, people will leave behind that. So I, we had to build into like annual things or systemic things where we intentionally appreciate the people who serve. The last one is mentoring. A lot of great people leave a church where they don't feel like there's some kind of pathway to growth. So the, and this, these are people who want to go to the next level in leadership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. If I don't feel like, I've lost so many people that way, yeah. particularly women, because I don't mentor women. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so women, we've, had, we've lost dynamic women because they want, they want the pastor to pour into them. And I'm saying, hey, now I can't do it. Yeah. Amen. You got to know. See, see, here's what you got to know. When you go fishing, by the way, you got to be careful where you fish because some of us have certain seafood allergies. <laughs> see, see, I know all y'all in here ain't got no sinful background. I got some background. <laughs> there are places I can't go witness. I can't go to strip club and witness. Not once. I can't go in there and witness at all. I can go to crack house. No problemo. I don't need drugs. I'm crazy already. But I cannot go you know what I'm saying? You feel me, don't you? This is, these are fake people here. You better know who you can pour into. I can't pour nothing into you. Nothing. 
Then go see Sister Jackson. She poured in. Here. So, 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 so if this not some, now we got a system in place. We got a system in place um, that's helping people feel like there is a process by which I can go from being a lay person to being in maybe even professional ministry. Yeah. You know, so I always send them to Bible college. Go on to Bible college. That's what I did. Yeah. But but people will feel like they'll 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 go somewhere where they feel like they're being mentored and they feel like they have opportunity for growth, and and, we, and you know, so you have to pay attention to those things in our ministry. Okay, brother, I got you. I see your hand. How are we doing on time, Derek? You good? You good? <laughs> you say you good? Okay. Yeah. Uh, amen. A nobody is better than the wrong body. I'd rather have a vacancy than a problem. Because it's harder to remove a person than it is to place them. Always try before you buy. We, we don't have enough systemic methods by which people, we have something in our church called taste and see. Taste and see is, and, and this, this, this came out of several things. What I, what, I, what I discovered is when people feel called to preach in church, I've never been actively involved in a 100% white church, so I, I know the black church pretty good, and I know the black Baptist church. That's my history, the black Baptist church. I know that thing. I know that thing. Who, where y'all at? Where y'all at? Don't it, it's just, it's another world, right? In the Black Baptist Church, if somebody gets on fire for the Lord, you know what people mean to say? Oh, he gonna preach. It can't be that you done fell in love with Jesus. You can't fall in love with Jesus. You got to preach. If you, cause, cause the only people that's in love with Jesus up there on the pulpit. You gonna stop getting high and all that? You must be called to preach. You be reading the Bible like that? Boy, I can see you preaching now. So, so what happens is nobody, everybody on fire got to be called to preach. So you get this dude, and he can't preach his way out of, if he put a gun in his head, he couldn't preach a whole sermon. But he on fire. So what we had in the Baptist church was a system where, because he walked with God and he says, I must be called, so we give him a trial, it's called a trial sermon. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You get a trial sermon. Let me tell you the real deal about a trial sermon. It ain't no trial. The license is already in the pastor's office, already signed by all the ordained clergy. It's just a formality. He gonna have his family there and everything. It ain't no trial, because if it was a trial, we listen to that joker preacher say, you ain't, this ain't for you. I don't care how bad he do, we gonna cry over him and say, you gonna get there, you gonna get there. He will sit the rest of his life in that pulpit. Nobody wants to hear him preach. In fact, if anybody discovers that he's preaching that Sunday, they will visit another church. <laughs> and what I'm saying is, what we, what we, that helped bore, birth something called, we call taste and see. Because what I think we need to do is, is let people try different ministries temporarily and see if, you, if, you, if it's the right fit. Because yeah. everybody doesn't know their spiritual gift and don't know where they fit in the body. So sometimes you may have to try working with the children. Yeah. Then you go in there, if you want to choke a child out, you know that ain't your thing. <laughs> I was going to choke your son out. So I'm not coming back. <laughs> but what if you already signed up and they already took you through training and you was obligated? So you got to take medicine to go in children's church. <laughs> I'm saying give people a chance, let them try something out. We put you in the alto section. There was not one song you was on key at any time. So we, don't spit that water on nobody. So this, this, what we're gonna do with you is, we're gonna put you in the deaf ministry. <laughs> put you right in the deaf ministry and you're gonna lead worship to the deaf people. That's where we're gonna put you. Cause we now know where you fit. So back to your question, I'd rather have nobody than the wrong body. But there's some situations where you gotta be praying, God, I need this spot filled. More than others, more than others. I saw, I saw a hand, yes ma'am. Back to your... Um... Y'all yeah, know I was wanting to be a comedian, that's where that <laughs> just pops out. 
Yeah. You had a 60-minute service. Yep. When they start to grow, mm -hmm. and there are other people who are with you who are church people, do you have another service for them that's more than 60 minutes? Well, we didn't at that time. I th we tried to make the midweek experience that for believers, like during the week where they would come out. Um, but I've, what I've discovered is, is that if somebody wants to make the base, the anointing of a service in its length, then they're mistaken. Because a service doesn't have to be eternal for it to be immortal. God can move in the time frame that he has. The reason why God needs more time is because we got too much fat in the service. There are only moments when he moves anyway. He ain't moving on announcements. So you know what we did with our announcements? We loaded them up on the offering. There are things you can layer, right, to save time, to be efficient. Now, now because people want to worship so long, including me, we do have our service about 75 minutes now, sometimes 70. But our service, we have to do, do a new service every 90 minutes. So the longer it goes, the more complicated it gets. And if you're going to be a church with multiple services, you don't have the luxury of going two or three hours and sitting in a Holy Ghost bath. And so it's about, I think it's about preference. If somebody's got to go somewhere where they got to get that, then, then don't help me reach unsaved people then. Go somewhere where you can be about you. I don't go to Zion for me. That's the difference. It's not a church that I would join. I would go to a church where they would go worship hard for about an hour. I love worship. And then the preaching would be, if it's great preaching, that's great. If it's great teaching, it's, in, it's an impartation. Yeah. I like that, right? Yeah. Where, where I left with something that, God, I, you have just, my life was transformed in your presence. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You got to know what your lane is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not giving people exactly what I want. And what happens is the saints who lost our hunger for evangelism and reaching the lost start complaining about what they're not getting. And then the church starts shifting in the keeping the, the fish in the aquarium comfortable instead of going out in the ocean and getting new fish. And if everybody in the aquarium knew that I'm fishing too and I'm trying to reach people um, and stop becoming so myopically focused on what I want out of the experience as opposed to what I can get. But, you know, that's, that's always a tension. It's always a tension. So every now and then we have to do something to keep the saints happy. I don't have to, but I do it. Yeah, because you, sometimes you have a group of older people who want that way it's laid out. I got you. Get them to switch over is kind of so this is how I do that. That's a great point. I had all of my elders, when we started our church, we, made, we, we started church in 2000. In 2005, we ordained our first elder board, and they were elders, literally elders. In fact, so y'all know, y'all know I'm crazy. I joke about stuff today. I shouldn't, so I'm going to joke about this. <laughs> my elders, uh, this, it got so old that I have elders, they walking in on walkers to the elder board meeting. They got on the pens. If you ask them that afternoon, do we have an elder board meeting, they don't even know we had one. <laughs> so this is what I did for my elders to get them sold on this. This is what I did. I had my elders bring a picture to the board meeting of their grandchildren. And we put their pictures up and they all had stories about them. And every elder had a grandchild in trouble. I said to them with tears, would you help me reach him? I feel it now. Would you help me reach him? We can't reach him doing church like you like it. I got to really water this down. It's a game changer. I'd do anything to not worry about him going to hell. You see? There's somebody you connected to that you'd have to send to my church. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with being that church where everybody can't make it in another church. Send them to me. I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. You come just as you are and be loved. Any condition, I don't care, you gay, crazy, psycho, depressed. We take them any kind of way. Eight to 80, blind, crippled, crazy. They can't walk, we'll drag them. It's got to be beyond you. Now, if you don't know any people 
who are lost, then to, to me, you're too saved. You know, Christians have Christian bowling leagues, Christian golf clubs, Christian Uno, because y'all don't play cards because you think cards are the devil, so you think the jack from hell or something. You don't play space, all you play is Uno. And Christian checkers. We don't do nothing with sinners. You don't have no unsaved friends? Christian car wash. <laughs> I mean, we don't know any heathen that could use this. I just think it's so many. So what I say is, if you want to transition, do a churchy service for the Christians and then do a heathen service. Go heathen on them. <laughs> Change the sanctuary up, do something different. Do something to make, you know, stop making. See, and then, then I got, had to deal with people. I, got, I have one elder, I love him so much. Every time men would come in our church with their hats on, he would just, just go into like a, a, a conniption. Pastor, I just got a problem with the hats. I said, let me, let me ask you a question. So I don't wear hats out of respect for him. I, I would never wear a hat in my building, only because of him. It, basically, he's not even biblical. In, in the Bible, it was the women. See, first of all, most people had these rules about attire, don't even know what the Bible says. Right. Right. Ain't nothing in the Bible saying you're supposed to wear a hat. That's a cultural issue. It's a military thing. It's respecting the building. I get all that. But it ain't got, really ain't got nothing to do with the Bible. So, so I said, let me ask you a question. I said, what if you just got to know the person before you tried to tell them to take their hat off? Your first thing is, take their hat off your head, young man. They think that's, that's, that this generation don't go for that. Josh McDowell says, rules without relationships leads to rebellion. You want to put rules on people when they walk in the door, you don't even know them. So this is what happened one Sunday, and I pointed out to him. We had a guy come to our church in a wheelchair. He had a red skin coat and a red skin hat. He, when he came in, I could tell he was somebody popular because I heard a buzz when he pushed him down to the front. It turned out he was a kingpin drug dealer who had got shot in his neck, and he was paralyzed. And they wheeled him in. No, he got shot in his head. And I knew this from LaShawn Hamilton. LaShawn Hamilton had invited him. So, so he's, he got a slug in his head. And he wears the hat because he wants to hide the scar. If you would have asked him to take his hat off, he'd have said, get me out of here. We'd have lost the battle. You, you got to get to know people. My father told me this. So when people come in our church, they can come in their jeans hanging down. They, we we got to accept them as they are. My father says, son, when he who is eternal becomes internal, he'll change the externals. We want to change the way people dress before they even know the Lord. And it took you 30 years to dress like that. <laughs> You've been saying 30 years for the Lord. You got some outfits though for then, right? <laughs> Remember how y'all used to dress? So we expect people to look like us, talk like us, act like us, and they don't know the God that's been working on us. What kind of stuff is that? It's absolutely asinine. We're too Christian. To even reach the world he's called us to reach. So you know where Jesus would be? Jesus was so secret, he was so unchurch oriented that the religious people was judging him. What you doing over the hooker's house? What you doing on Matthew? Matthew was gangster. What you doing on Matthew's house? What you doing on Levi's house? You know he ain't right. You know what Jesus says? This is my target. I'm a physician. The sick need a physician. Those of you who think you will don't need one. This is my target. Any company that's successful has to know your target. And be effective at it. Don't, you don't have to fake, just be you, because they know game, too. So that's, our, that's, that's what we've done. And, and, the, and the fight has been, believe it or not, the fight has been staying in that lane and not letting church people pull us back over in the churchism. That's the fight. Bishop? How did the shift? change as well and yeah so so my preaching has evolved over the years um, as I got more comfortable being me because when I grew up looking at preaching I was able to make a, a standard of preaching my pastor wasn't a great preacher but he would bring in great preachers so I would do what they did so they would go all right <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> yeah 
And so I would, I would, I would literally, I was like 20 years old up there saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Trying to move my hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was crazy, man. So, so this is me. This is me. I walk around, I crack jokes, I yell sometimes, I cry, I laugh. They just wanted to be authentic. The only thing I change is I try to be careful if I say something that's, that's heavy Christian, I try to go back and explain what I'm saying. But when you t- let me say something, even somebody that don't know God can feel them. Like when you have been in the presence of God so strong and you knew he was there, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is an unsaved person don't know what it is, but they know, it, they know something is in this room. Something is in this room and it ain't normal, right? They, because, because they have a spirit, it's just not been brought alive. So I, I haven't really changed my preaching from that standpoint. Now, when I go into a church and it's a churchy environment and it's preachy and all that, I know how to do that, like, you know, get people. Ex- what, what about your topics, yeah. the, the yeah. subjects you're preaching on, the mm-hmm. lengths of your sermons? Yeah. yeah. Those are great questions, great questions. I, I try when I'm being... Um, when I'm really in that mindset to be more topical, but I'm an expositor by nature. So I try to do maybe um, thematic series that, 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 that tends to bring momentum. Like if you're talking about a topic, because it's always about, in order to grow a church, you gotta have investors and inviters. You gotta have people invest in your ministry and they will give to the ministry as much as they trust the ministry. And you gotta have people inviting. And I find that people are more apt to invite somebody to something if they know what it is ahead of time. Like pastor's gonna be talking about how to get out. So, so what we do is, Bishop, we have, we have no problem saying we're gonna do a stewardship series, right? It's a part of our culture. Yeah. We're gonna start a stewardship series. Now I'm Skeeter Jackson from, from the cut in Aurora. I ain't talking about up Aurora, I'm talking about down in the, in the projects of Aurora. And I hear at Restoration, they doing a stewardship series. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? Language. Do you say, if you say something like, how to go from, how to get your money right. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. We're gonna talk about how to get your money right, right? Yeah. It's intentional to broaden the scope. How to get your money right, the stewardship series. If you wanna keep the saints from thinking you backslid. <laughs> so those are the kind of things that we try to keep in mind to, to market it to the people who need it the most. But you never stop being you. Cause you're the best you out there. So. So they will take you, it's all of the things that go with it. It's the, it's, it's the children's church, it's the youth ministry, it's the love. I'll tell you one thing that'll set, that'll set a church apart as it relates to reaching unchurched people is the love they feel and acceptance from the people already in. Yeah. Because people who are already in don't naturally love people they don't know. Right. We naturally gravitate towards each other, gravitates, yeah. gravitate towards each other. Yeah. But when people come in here smelling like urine or liquor or they're disheveled, or they look lost or whatever, and we intentionally love on them, say, welcome, so glad to have you. How can we be of help to you? And they know they're valued. That's, that goes further than the preaching. Yeah, yes, sir. So you, you make a statement about discipleship, that people lead great leaders, 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 good leaders, 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 because of, they don't see how they can grow, right? So my question would be from the evangelistic part, mm-hmm. kingdom in, yes. how did you fit your discipleship model to keep them growing? Yeah, so our system is, our system is meet God, grow closer to him, and serve him. That's our system. We believe Sundays is a meet God experience. It's, a, it's an environment where people can encounter God and meet him. The grow closer to him, we do that in small groups. And the reason why we do that that way is because when I, I had conversations with several people, and it's, it's never changed no matter, who I talk to, no matter who I talk to, I said, tell me what impacted your spiritual life the most when you looked at where you went from one level of spirituality to another, what, what caused the most growth in your life? When I looked at my life, it was never in church on Sunday that I grew the most. It was always when I was able to sit at a table with a man who was in front of me spiritually and I could ask him questions. And he could pour into me and say, this is how you pray, man. 
or I was in a context where I could interact. And, and Andy Stanley says like, he says, people grow better in circles than they do in rows. Because it's, it's harder to disciple 600 people in the sanctuary than it is six people in your, in your living room. So we believe that if you put spiritual people in a room with people who are trying to grow, that's the greatest context. So that's our system. We try to get people to come to church, try to get them in a group where they can grow. Then we try to get them to serve the Lord with their gifts in their life. It's not a perfect system, but it's, it's, it's the one we use, right? Anyone else? Those are great questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And show them your love. Yeah. Yeah. I don't intentionally preach on anything, but any sin that's, that's biblical, I, I feel I don't love them if I don't tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. But it's speaking the truth in love. Yeah. So, so it, let's just say. Let's say it's a, um, a man who's, uh, who, who has a husband. This is a man, these men are married. Let's just say it's two men who are married and they come to our church. I personally think that's wrong. Yeah. I think it's a sin. I think it's a violation of God's covenant, right? That's not going to be the first thing I say to him. First thing I'm saying is, hey, welcome. Good to have you here. If God tells me to do a series on marriage, maybe I will get to that. But I'm not intentionally trying to call them out. See, I believe is the closer you get to the Lord, the more his light shines on you. The stuff that you thought was cool starts getting tricky anyway. I've had gay people come to me and say, we just didn't think, we ain't preach nothing about it. We're like, we, I don't, this ain't right. I got to get out of this. Amen. Let's talk about how you should get out of that because I don't think it's right either. They never knew it. Like, it's not something you have. I think Christians are so fast to show people what they stand for. As opposed to showing their love. Like the first thing we say is, you know, we don't play that around here and we stand against that and we don't, we don't tolerate that. What? What? Is that how you came to Christ? God tolerated a lot to save you. All of men, me too. And he's still tolerating a lot to keep us. It may not be that. But it's something that Jesus' blood had to pay for, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can't hear you, man. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah. <laughs> she did that. Thank you. Yeah. But I wanted you to share with the audience um, about how our church became more of an outreach church and a more giving church to the community. I think that's an important piece that we were missing in the beginning, and you challenged that. And, about the story you did when you were dressed as a homeless person. And all that. So. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That was just up to y'all. All right. So one Sunday I dressed up as a homeless man. I had a lady who does makeup for, she does makeup for Hollywood actually. She lives in the D.C. area. And she came and made me up. I don't have pictures of it. But she had me looking like, like I was 90 years old. I had holes in my clothes. I had the gloves with the fingers out. I had dirt on me and everything. And my wife, no, I parked my car in a neighborhood near our church. And I walked to church on a walker. And uh, I stood outside the church because um, I wanted to check the temperature of our church to see if we were generous. And I was there. We had 3,000 people pass me. I got $9. And I got seven for one. People were pulling their kids away from me. And what was happening was they didn't know it was me. And I would just be out there like this. I was shaking. They would, I was like, I can't believe this church is so cold. So I had a, uh, a, a, one of these on, a lapel. So when it was time for preaching, I would go around through the, behind the building and come in through the back. And I would start the sermon from back where nobody could see me. And I was saying, yeah, this is me, y'all. I'm really hurt today at every service. And they didn't know, because I told everybody, if you had this service, do not tweet about it. Don't take pictures of me. Don't post it. Because some stuff you can't even get, get away with because everybody's snitching. So when I got on, when I came up from behind the stage, people were in shock, gas. And I said, so we did a whole series that God is for the poor, because I saw that our church wasn't generous. We didn't love on sick people. 
And I said, y'all ain't even love on me and I'm the pastor. Let me tell you this, one of our elders tried to get them to call the police to have me removed. <laughs> he says, get that man off this property. To this day, he don't know that I know who he is. <laughs> That's one of my elders. Tried to get a homeless man off the property. So, so that was an eye opener for us, a real eye opener. You said something else. Um, oh, let me say this. Let me say this. I did a I did a measure one time. Now, see, because I'm so I'm I, I can be extreme with this. We don't have our own building. I was going to create a smoking section in our building. By the way, I hate cigarette smoke. I can't stand it. It's just like oh man, I can tell when people smoking, but people people smoke. So I was going to have a little section. Like y'all got the quiet room, I was gonna have a smoking section where people can watch the service and be in there smoking their cigarettes. So this was, this was, that's out there, ain't it? So this is a true story, this is a true story. I preached a message one time and at the end of the message, and I've had it confirmed by several people, there was a man in the sanctuary to my, to my right who lit up an electric cigarette. And those electric ones, they, they blew at the tip, but they blow out smoke, but it's not the same. Anybody know that? So somebody said, well, what you gonna do about it? He says, how'd you feel about that? I said, it was a compliment. I said, anybody that I know has smoked say, the best time to smoke a cigarette is after a good meal. <laughs> you know what he was saying? Amen. <laughs> it's all how you look at it. I'd rather him smoke now than to be smoking for eternity. Amen, amen, amen. I think we're done for the day. So what's next, Pastor? Thank y'all for putting up with me. It's been an honor to be here. Amen.